Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's get through this. So, lentigo and malignant melanoma. You've probably heard of one, malignant melanoma, which is not a good diagnosis. Have you heard of lentigo? You've seen it. Your parents or your grandparents have it for sure. Old age spots, they're also called, or liver spots. Yeah, because they look the color of liver, I guess. So that's where we're going. It's week four. Did I say that? Summer 2022. Uh, Interesting about malignant melanoma is so good at metastasizing. Sometimes it even metastasizes to the skin in an area not even like this guy had melanoma on his hand and it metastasized to his chest. So it can metastasize anywhere. It likes the brain. It likes the lungs. Um, it's a nasty, nasty disease. If you catch it early, it's not that worrisome. If you catch it late, um, it's... It's almost always fatal. But let's start with lentigo, the old age spots, liver spots, solar lentigo, lentigo senialis, senial freckle, pronounced lentigo. Uh, super common in old people. The plural of lentigo lesions is lentigenes. Lentigenes, like, oh, grandpa has lentigenes on his arm. That's multiple lentigo lesions. There are several subclasses of this, which we're not going to get into. We're just going to talk about really the most common type of it. And it typically, the run-of-the-mill lentigo lesion is a macule usually, uh, which is less than one centimeter in size. You remember, it's a brown oval patch. Remember, macules are flat. They're not raised or elevated. On the face, it tends to be more patchy looking, bigger lesions. And they tend to be not so round as we will see. Um, they're usually not variegated. What's that mean, variegated? It means they're not very colorful. They don't have multiple colors in them. They're usually just like this one is not really variegated. It doesn't have different shades of color in it. Uh, they are usually pop up in uh, sun-exposed regions. They are not raised and crusty. If it's raised and crusty, it's not lentigo. It's probably seborrheic keratosis, which I don't know if we'll get to that, but I got YouTube videos on that one. It's a very common lesion. That one's usually raised and crusty. These are not raised and crusty. On the face, as I said, they're often they're not round looking. They can be more kind of scary looking. I mean, that, that kind of looks like cancer in a way. Uh, so they can be very difficult to tell apart from other things when they get uh, on the uh, on the skin of the face. They sometimes are bl black or even dark, dark brown. They can have irregular borders like that one has, and it can be difficult to tell them apart sometimes. Can it become cancerous? It usually doesn't become cancerous, but once in a blue moon, as they say, uh, it can become cancerous. Uh, and it goes through two stages when it does become cancerous. Of course, it's hard to tell without a biopsy if it becomes cancerous or not. Uh, the first step is from lentigo is to lentigo maligna. That's a precancerous stage one. Some call it a cancer in situ where there are cancerous cells, but they haven't gotten down into the dermis. Can it spread if it doesn't get down into the dermis? What if it stays on the surface of your skin? Can it spread? Can it go to your brain and liver? No, it can't. There's no blood vessels there. Um, so it can actually get very, very big. Um, um, like this lady here, a lentigo uh, malignant lesion. Started out as a little tiny five millimeter lesion. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. She got a biopsy and it was lentigo malignant. There are cancerous cells, but they're not spreading downward. They're spreading outward over the surface. That's called radial spread. Radial spread means the cancer is spreading across the surface and not going down uh, into the dermis where the blood vessels are. Sometimes, 5 to 25 years later, uh, this could turn into cancer where it dives down into the dermis and subcutaneous layer and gets into the bloodstream. Uh, when it gets, when it starts diving down, which you can really only tell by histology, 
It's called lentigo malignant melanoma. So that's went down the pathway of lentigo to lentigo malignant, which is precancer, to lentigo malignant melanoma, which is very, very dangerous. But it, it's on the face, and this is usually only on the face. Um, it takes a long time to develop there. I'm much more worried about basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma uh, on the face. Um, they tend to pop up in older people, as we said. Again, on the face, they can be very difficult to tell apart from something called melasma. We'll look at that one. Uh, that's called the mask of pregnancy. That look, looks exactly like a melasmic lesion. Um, Seborrheic keratosis is called the great imitator. Uh, it's often crusty, but it can start out flat and look just like lentigo. And then superficial spreading malignant melanoma is also typically flat and it can look just like this. So sometimes uh, these four are very difficult to tell apart without biopsy. Uh, here's a melasma uh, lesion and it's even a little variegated which makes you nervous. I mean if you ever saw this on someone's back in the middle of someone's back you always ask the patient do, do you know about this lesion and they of course they don't they don't look back there. Um, if they say, oh, yeah, that's been there for years and years, you know, my primaries looked at it, dermatologists looked at it, then you don't worry about it. You might take a measurement of it to make sure it's not getting bigger. But you guys will run into when you, you'll see these on their back and they'll have no idea that they have this thing there. Um, and it breaks the malignant melanoma rules. It's bigger than the eraser tip of a pencil. It's got different colors in it. It's darker here. Um, it's, it's a little irregular the borders are a little regular um, so you would refer this to a dermatologist or you would tell the patient you better go to a dermatologist I can't guarantee you that's not cancer um, it's probably not but uh, you never know that one did turn out to be just melasma um, here's subarate keratosis I mean it looks pretty much the same uh, it's even it's starting to get a little crusty here uh, but that turned out had to get it biopsied because uh, it was growing it turned out to be seborrheic keratosis. Uh, here's another lentigo lesion. That looks just like this one, almost. That's cancer. That's superficial spreading malignant melanoma. Very, very dangerous. Uh, and that, that one's lentigo. So even dermatologists have trouble with these things. Uh, and when they're in doubt, they just order a biopsy and they find out real quick what they are. They have special glasses that they can really look closely at this. And sometimes there's little clues. Uh, of the difference between these, uh, but for your purposes, I mean, this is really hard to tell apart. Uh, what are some risk factors for developing lentigo? Being Caucasian, being a white person, probably going to get these in old white people. They always, I got a couple of these popping up on me. Um, history of frequent sun exposure when you're younger, uh, and yep, yeah, those are the big ones. White person, old history of sun exposure when you were young. And that's classic lentigo or lentigenes lesions on the person's hands here. Typically brown, but not always. Sometimes they have a little red. When they get red, that kind of can, makes you a little nervous about squamous cell carcinoma. It tends to be red, and but squamous cell carcinoma usually has a yellow crust on top of it. Uh, because usually lentigo is brown, but those are just multiple lentigenes. Okay, some more classic one. There's the classic presentation. Grandma, grandpa's probably got some of these on their hand where been get hit by the sun for many years on top of the head. Run-of-the-mill lentigenes. Uh, this one turned out to be lentigo maligna. Um, it's big. It's 12 millimeters in size. It is variegated. It's got different colors. It's almost back to the normal skin color here. So anytime you see that, um, that should trigger a dermatological referral just to protect that license of yours. Make sure that's in your patient's records. I would have them sign it so they can't be come back five years down the road and try to sue you because you missed this type of a lesion. What about freckles? Lentigo versus freckles. Kind of the bottom line, lentigo is usually old people, freckles is usually young people, usually kids and teens. But there are some other differences. Uh, when you go out in the sun, lentigo lesions don't change color. They're always the same color. Grandpa's 
lesions on the hand are always brown no matter what time of year it is. Uh, little Johnny's little freckles on his face, when he goes out in the sun, they become black. And then in the wintertime, they become very light. Um, so that's a big difference between the two. By the way, the word for freckles in dermatology land is aphilides. Aphilides is freckles. Make sure you add that to your vocabulary list. So aphilides are quickly darkened by sun exposure. Lentigo, old people, aphilides, and young people. There's run-of-the-mill aphilides on a very young person. And there's grandpa. Uh, the same color. He's been burned by the sun. He doesn't wear sunblock. He's been burned, but they're not black. They're still the same, same color. They don't change color. Um, what about kind of getting a little deeper into lentigo lesions? What are they from? Um, they're from a localized region of too many melanocytes. So if you do a histological sample of grandpa here, if you sample this area, and then sample the lentigines or the lentigo lesion, there'll be way too many melanocytes in this area and not as many over here. So it's a collection of melanocytes. And we know what melanocytes do. They inject skin cells with melanin. And the more, the more they inject, or the more they are, the more skin cells get injected and the darker your skin gets in that area. Okay, aphilides or freckles uh, they are from hyperactive melanocytes. So they, uh, the, the group of them, uh, why the neighbors don't get hyperactive and the little round focus of them get hyperactive, we don't understand that. But when the group of them get hit who are sensitive to UV radiation, they, they go crazy and they overproduce melanin. There's not too mel many of them. There's the same number of melanocytes in a freckle lesion. That lesion, the ones in the lesion are just hyperactive ones. And why they cluster together, we don't know the answer to that. Then Tygo, there's just too many of them in the lesion. Okay, um, when do biopsy, biopsy, and we'll look at this, I think at the end of the, this lecture, the ABCD rules for melanoma, uh, but when, or when to refer out, uh, anytime there is a change of growth in the lesion, that's why it's a good idea to measure that lesion if, if it's big on their back, even if they say, ah, oh, that's been around forever. Uh, and if you watch that thing grow be before your eyes, it's probably cancer. So rapid growth is the number one trigger for a dermatological appointment. Um, if it has irregular borders, if it's variegated, different colors within it, uh, if it starts becoming raised up, uh, especially if it's nodule appearance, if that indicates fast-growing cells, if it starts to lift off the skin, uh, those are all bad things. How do you treat these lentigo lesions? They're pretty tough to treat. Uh, the main type of treatment, we'll use this in other skin conditions, is called retinoids, uh, like tretinoid cream, uh, retinoic acid is an AKA, or tarzotin cream. Uh, these are all of the class of retinoids. Um, there are some laser therapies which work good for lentigo lesions on the hands. There's some other treatments. There's chemical peels. This uh, trichloroacetic acid sometimes works pretty good. Here's a patient who had those done uh, and it lightened the lesion a little bit, but they're pretty tough to, to completely get rid of these things. That's also called a chemical peel. Uh, cryotherapy is hit or miss. They, it's just like a little, looks like a pen kind of, and they freeze the lesion. Um, sometimes it works good. People, uh, white people with fair skin, it seems to work pretty good. Uh, people with a little more color, they have to be careful because it can make the lesion worse, make it even more pigmented or hypopigmented. It could turn into a white spot as it kills off all the melanocytes in the area. So that one's a little shaky. All right, malignant melanoma, we'll start part one of this today. We'll do part two next week. Uh, AKAs, sometimes it's just called melanoma, sometimes MM. Um, it shouldn't be called superficial spreading, SSM. That's a subtype of melanoma. Uh, and lentigo malignant melanoma is a subtype of malignant melanoma. Um, so the, they're just going to call it malignant melanoma or melanoma on the boards. And what is it? It is a malignancy of these guys. Here's the little octopus-like thing. 
That's the one that gives us our skin color. The more hyperactive that is, the more carotenocytes will be injected and the darker your skin will be. It's a mutation in this thing uh, where it doesn't, it lives too long. That's what all cancer is. Cells normally die at a certain rate. Uh, and in cancer cells, that, that cell death, that apoptosis mechanism is turned off and they become immortal. Uh, plus, sometimes these cells are attached to the stratum basale layer. Uh, they normally are stuck there. In cancer cells, they can get loose and start to migrate. They can migrate away from the basement membrane. That's a, not a normal activity for a cell, but a cancer cells can migrate. And these guys really can migrate uh, when, they, when they become mutated. And the, the first word that comes in your head when you, sh when you hear malignant melanoma, think metastasis. This thing can metastasize super easy. It almost seeks out the blood vessels and the lymph vessels. Uh, it can detach from its, its resting spot and move right into the dermis uh, and get into the microcirculation and off it goes, or get into the lymph capillary and off it goes. It's not terribly destructive. If we, when we look at basal cell carcinoma, I think B for bad, that will rip a hole in your face. But it doesn't, it's incredibly destructive, but it doesn't metastasize very much. It doesn't often kill people, but it can invade the brain. It can go right through the cheek and through the bone and get into the brain. It's just, it just has an amazing ability to destroy tissue. Not, that's not true for melanoma. It's not destructive. I can almost guarantee I ask you a question like that. So it's, it's, its ability to metastasize to other spots in the body is what's so dangerous about it. It also occurs in sun-exposed regions, but not always. Sometimes it can occur even inside the body, in the vaginal canal, in the mouth, uh, even in the esophagus and the GI tract. That's rare, but it's possible. It can happen in the eye. It can even happen on the pia or arachnoid mater. There's been cases. It's not the normal, but it, but it is possible. So it doesn't always have, it's not all to do with sun exposure. Um, some types are really, really aggressive. We'll look at the types next time. Um, the most common type, which is superficial spreading malignant melanoma, it has a slower radial growth phase. And we said radial growth phase means the cancer spreads across the skin, the surface of the skin, and doesn't dig down really quick. The bad ones called nodular melanoma, there's almost no radial growth phase. It, when it's born, it just goes straight down and gets into the blood vessels. People can be dead within four to six months from, from nodular melanoma showing up, uh, which is not a good thing. Luckily, that's not the most common. Superficial spreading. That's superficial spreading right there. Now, that's the most common type, and it usually gives you enough time at least to get to the dermatologist. Um, that's everything I just said. The second most common type, uh, that's nodular, has very short radial growth phase, goes straight down. And we'll look at that more next week. Everything I said there. Very dangerous. Nodular, malig nodular malignant melanoma. Uh, we got to go a little deeper. So what goes wrong with the melanocytes? I said they become mutated. What, what do you mean they become mutated? A little bit deeper into that. Um, it's typically a mutation in, these, um, in the nucleus of the melanocytes, specifically in the genes that code for what are called proto-oncogenes, like the BRAF, the NRAS, and especially the KIT mutation. Uh, so these are genes that normally regulate the cell, and they regulate apoptosis. They tell the cell when to die. If the cell isn't dying, they, they'll destroy the cell. So they're kind of the cops of the cell, and they tell the cell, okay, you're living too long, it's time to die. Uh, or, oh, you're detaching from the basement membrane, you're not supposed to do that, we're going to blow you up and kill you. Uh, so they, they keep cancer away. Uh, these pro-oncogenes. And if you get a mutation in any of these genes, they don't work, and there's no cop to say, uh-oh, the cell's drifting away from the stratum basale. Uh-oh, it's heading for a blood vessel. Blow up the cell. There's nobody to do that. Okay, so those are all oncogenes. Uh, let's see. Fun facts. Epidemiology of malignant melanoma. Fifth most common type of cancer in men. 
Um, they're expected to be about 200,000 cases in 2002. And in the past decade, the number of invasive cases has increased by 31% in the last 10 years. Um, we don't know why that is. Uh, we're really good at keeping statistics now. It's not a fluke. Um, it's probably because of the ozone layer. Uh, there's, of course, you guys know the story with that. We have a shield of ozone that circles the Earth, and it absorbs all three types of UV radiation. It doesn't do as good a job with UVA, uh, but it's very important from shielding us. And, of course, all these refrigerants and solvents and foams and aerosols, uh, the big ones are the aerosols and the refrigerants, like that running all our air conditioners right now. Um, that gets up and it binds to the ozone and destroys it, makes it ineffective at, at absorbing UV radiation. And so as that start, as the ozone layer starts to thin, there's nothing stopping these UV, this UVA uh, radiation from hitting our skin and mutating melanocytes. That's the theory anyway. And it's, it's a pretty good theory because I can't think of any other reason. Uh, let's see, it's believed that the incidence will double in the next 15 years, so not a good thing. Uh, the current lifetime risk of getting this is about 1.5% chance in your lifetime that you'll get one. It's definitely on the rise. In 1935, and given maybe the statistics weren't so great back then, but 1935 the risk was 0.07%, and now it's 1.5%, so it's definitely getting worse. Uh, if it metastasizes, it's not good. This five-year survival rate is horrible. It's only 10% with treatment. That's worse than pancreatic cancer and esophageal cancer and thyroid cancer. Um, so you got to catch this. This is what killed Bob Marley. And as we'll look at that, what type he had, some subungual malignant melanoma, which we'll look at later. Uh, if you catch it early, though, the survival rates, uh, the five-year survival is 93%. So that's really good. So you got to catch these early. You can't procrastinate. There's a nodule right there, 10 millimeter nodule with a red base. Very, very dangerous. That's malignant melanoma. That's the worst type to have right there. I know a student who had, your, your guys' age, who had one. Uh, first quarter I started teaching this class, and he's like, oh, my God. Got to get that checked. Oh, it's been there. No, get that checked. And it was malignant melanoma, nodular malignant melanoma. They took it off. Uh, these are really dangerous. Um, yep, white people. This is a white person, in case you don't know. Um, <laughs> that was a great guy. Seen that movie? That's a great movie. You haven't seen White Man Can't Jump? Oh, God, you got that's a great movie. Um, white people are at risk. What kind of white people? Even Australian, New Zealand. People who are down by the equator, lots of sun, lots of UV radiation are at the greatest risk. Uh, median age of diagnosis is 57. Median age of death is 67. Now, that's not a good number right there. Um, more risk factors. If, if grandpa and grandma or mom or dad or brother or sister, if somebody else has had melanoma, you have to be very careful. You're at risk for this. Uh, if you are Caucasian, but if you're if you have red hair or blue or green eyes, you're at, at significantly more risk. Top of that, when you go to the beach and all your friends get a little bit tan over the summer, and all you do is get red, you don't tan at all. You're at risk. You have to be careful for that. Um, let's see. Do we have tanning beds in here? Tanning beds aren't good either. Uh, I threw this in here. This is a good one to know. Kind of a rare one, but uh, xeroderma pigmentosa, xeroderma pigmentosa. It's rare, uh, but it is uh, another gene mutation where the d mutated DNA doesn't have the ability to repair itself. And those affected are incredibly sensitive. They just walk outside like a day like this. They walk out to the railroad tracks and back, they get burned. Um, so they really have a sensitivity to these things. Um, and they get affinities. They get freckles like crazy just from going out in the sun a little bit like this girl has. She has it right here. Uh, and it's great risk for all skin cancers. They have to wear sunblock all the time. They shouldn't let the skin hit their bodies. 
uh, more risk factors as foot. This cracks me up. This, I guess that's a farmer tan there. Or oh, that's not even a tan, right? It's a sunburn. It's a wicked sunburn. He's like all laughy. He won't be laughing when he's trying to sleep. Who's who? Everybody's been sunburned in here before. Yeah, no, it's to the point you can't sleep. He's not going to be able to sleep very good. Uh, but yeah, risk factors are a history of uh, in really bad sunburns. Four or more, they say. Uh, so you don't want to get burned like this. That greatly increases tanning bed exposure. Even the new tanning beds, you should not be in those tanning beds uh, in your teens and 20s, is w which is the time where everybody goes for those things. They can still increase your risk for cancer, no matter what the signs say. Um, having a lot of moles, if you have a lot of moles, normally you're at risk. Having a lot of freckles, you're more at risk. You have to be more careful. Um, so lots of these are moles are called acquired melanocytic nevi are the most common types of moles. I don't I think I have a YouTube on that. I don't think we'll get to that this quarter. Uh, but yeah, she's got 250 uh, moles on her body. She's at significant risk for melanoma. One of the moles could turn cancerous or she might get de novo. Uh, malignant melanoma may pop up. She's got so many moles she doesn't even see it coming anymore because she's got it kind of gets camouflaged in there. Uh, they probably popped up during childhood because they're acquired. You can be born with these. They're called congenital. Uh, but most of the time they pop up during childhood and during your teens. Uh, more risk factors. Having the KIT mutation. Again, one of those proto-onco mutations, especially the KIT mutation. How are you going to know if you have the KIT mutation? I don't even think the 23 or me or those testing. I don't think they still don't test for those things. Uh, but having a job outside, like you're a park ranger, you're a professional surfer, uh, someone who's out in the sun is obviously at risk for this stuff. Okay, let's look at these ABCs. These are always on boards. So these are the way to catch. These are for malignant melanoma, but they go for any lesion. So if a lesion breaks these rules, you're supposed to refer to the dermatologist ABCDE. A is asymmetrical shape. This one's crazy asymmetrical meaning there's no way to fold it if you trace it and make paper out of it. There's no way you can fold it perfectly in half. That's crazy asymmetrical here. Uh, and it goes to with a border irregularity. That kind of goes with asymmetry there. If it's variegated, you always worry. So it's dark in this here, and it's light red here, and it's brown, and it's almost black here. Uh, this is superficial spreading melanoma, and it almost has got a nodule starting. It's worrisome that this was the deadly, super deadly nodular melanoma. It turned out to be superficial spreading. Um, if the di diameter is greater than six millimeters, the diameter of a pencil, a number two pencil eraser, is five millimeters. So that's not that big. Um, so that's a, another warning side. And out of all of these, the biggest one is it's changing. The patient comes in and says, you know what, this thing's been growing. Over the last six months, it's gotten bigger. The thing's got to be biopsied. The trouble is all lesions, they tend when they first appear, they grow pretty fast, but then they stop and freeze. The cancers don't. They just keep going and going and going. Uh, and what's the problem with this ABCDD? The, the specificity is terrible. There's a lot of false positives. A lot of times it's actinic keratosis. Uh, or seborrheic keratosis. There's a lot of false alarms with it, but you still, it's the only way we really have to catch these things. And with a 10% five-year survival rate, I mean, you can't, that's where the dermatologist, it takes like six months to get into the dermatologists in this area. There's so many people. Um, it's tough to get in because of this, but that's all we have. Uh, so there's four types of melanoma we'll look at next time. Superficial spreading. There's lentigo malignant melanoma, which is on the face. Arcule lentiginous melanoma, uh, which is the most common for people of color. This is the one that gets under the nails. This is the one that killed Bob Marley. And then there's the dreaded nodular melanoma. Uh, and nails is actually the mnemonic for that. And I think we'll get into these more next week. And there's your bird. You probably had that. Have you had this bird yet? Oyster catcher? I think he had an oyster catcher. I have. Yeah, he had an oyster catcher. So 
So that's no excuse for missing the oyster catcher. See you guys later. Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. It is summer 2022. It is week five. It's actually, what day is it? It's Tuesday. And here we go. This is, we're still talking about malignant melanoma. We started it last week. We're going to get a little bit deeper into it this time. Uh, we said last time, we ended, I believe, on this slide, and we said there's four subtypes of malignant melanoma, or four different types of it. There's superficial spreading, there's lentigo malignant melanoma, there's RQO lentiginous melanoma, and nodular melanoma. Uh, so let's talk about these. Uh, superficial spreading melanoma, this is by far the most common if you're going to get Melanoma, this is probably the one you're going to get, about 70% of the melanoma pie, if you will, uh, typically diagnosed around the age of 50. Good thing about this one, it has a reasonably long radial growth phase, and we talked about that. That's Radial growth phase means it's growing over the skin in these directions, superficially. It's just spreading over the skin but it's not growing down into the plane of the page toward the dermis and subcutaneous uh, tissue, which would be uh, bad. So this one usually takes anywhere from 8 to 24 months before it dives down into the deadly vertical growth phase. So this one, at least you'll get a chance to go to the dermatologist. As I've said before, my beef here in the Bay Area, I've tried to get into several dermatologists uh, including Stanford, and it's uh, usually six to eight months to get in to see a dermatologist. Uh, typically, it could start anywhere, but it usually will start on the trunk somewhere in a man, uh, and in females, it usually happens on their legs, but it can start from anywhere. Typically starts de novo. What's that mean, de novo? That means it starts brand new, it doesn't pop out of any other skin lesion. Uh, but it can occasionally uh, start from a mole or some other type of lesion. So it's not always de novo. And when it's in its radial growth phase, it's considered, it's still cancer, mind you. Uh, it's considered a cancer, cancer in situ, which hasn't dived, it went down vertically toward the dermis and subcutaneous tissue. If it stays superficially, can it metastasize? No, there's no way, because there's no blood vessels uh, in the epidermis. The blood vessels start down in the, kind of at the dermal epidermal junction. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. It's when it dives down, that is where the trouble starts. So the treatment, if you catch it, if you catch a lesion, in this in situ phase, that's really good. The prognosis is very, very good. Here's a dermoscop, uh, dermoscopic view. So dermatologists have these giant microscope glasses they walk around with, um, and this is the view of lesions that they get, and you can really see the details. Uh, and this is definitely a cancerous type of lesion. Uh, or you, if you see anything like this, you always refer it out because it's variegated, right? There's dark color there. It's light. It's light here. It's almost going away here. Um, it's got irregular borders. You can't fold it in half, right? It breaks the ABCs we talked about uh, last week. It's bigger than the tip of a number two pencil eraser, so you would refer this thing out. After the radial growth phase is over and it does start growing down vertically, that can be very, very aggressive, and it can go very quick at that point. And the deeper it goes, the, the worse it gets. Um, and it's almost like it seems to seek out the lymph capillaries we've talked about before and the regular capillaries and invade them and get into the bloodstream. It's really weird. Some cancers uh, don't, like basal cell carcinoma, it doesn't do that. Um, it doesn't seem to seek out these capillaries, lymph capillaries and blood vessel capillaries. Uh, so it's really weird. We don't know why it, it is so darn uh, invasive. Um, the other sign on the surface that it's 
in the vertical growth phase is it will no longer be a flat lesion. Uh, it's gotten lumpy bumpy and there's a big nodule right here. That's a sign that this is going downward uh, into the dermis. And for those of you who don't, don't know, the skin has an epidermis on the top and then a dermis is deeper and then a subcutaneous tissue or hypodermis is the third layer down. Um, and so if you see a nodule in one of these, that's much more worrisome. Here's another one. Um, and yeah, so really bad looking. Superficial spreading melanoma, that's, that's in the vertical growth phase now. Uh, there's a big nodule. It's kind of hard to see, but that's coming out of the plane of the page. So not good. All right, talking about nodules... There's a second type of melanoma called nodular melanoma. This is the second most common type. This one is really dangerous, really bad news. There's actually four subtypes of nodular melanoma, which is way beyond the scope of this a lecture. Also shows up in the 50s. Counts for about 22% of melanomas. Again, seen on the trunk. Uh, in sun-exposed regions in men, seen on the legs in females. Um, this one doesn't typically show up, and superficial spreading, they don't typically show up on the face. Uh, that's the uh, lentigo malignant melanoma, which, uh, did we talk about that yet? I can't remember. Uh, but that's the one that shows up on the face. Just a side note here, occasionally superficial spreading melanoma can actually become the gross of nodular melanoma, histologically speaking. Uh, really, this guy waited way, way too long. Really poor prognosis. Huge, giant nodule right here, just full of cancer. Cancer's all over his body. It's a brain, his lungs, his liver. Uh, just waited way too long. Similar to the story to Bob Marley. Um, yeah, nodular melanoma is so dangerous is because it basically has no radial growth phase. When the lesion pops up, pops up, it immediately goes downward into the dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Very dangerous situation. Uh, the nodules can be different colors. They can be blue, black, brown, uh, pink, or red. Um, sometimes they can bleed and ulcerate, uh, which is not good. Kind of look like basal cell carcinoma at that point. Uh, but the nodule is the key. There's a red one, uh, and nodule, yeah, this is nodular melanoma, very dangerous. These ones almost always start de novo. They usually don't start for, from a mole or some other pre-existing problem. Again, very poor prognosis. you got to catch these ones early um, or you're not going to make it. Lentigo malignant melanoma, so let's talk about that. We talked about lentigo the last lecture, um, so it's another subcategory of melanoma. It's the third most common type, so superficial spreading malignant melanoma was number one, nodular melanoma was number two, and now we have lentigo malignant melanoma. Um, this one's made in about 10% of patients. It's almost the key with lentigo malignant melanoma. It almost always shows up on the face, the head, or the neck. Very rare that this one is anywhere else. Now, the risk of getting this one, unlike superficial spreading and nodular melanoma, this one is directly related to the number of sunburns that you've had when you're a kid. Not good to let your kids get sunburned. Uh, there's two groups of people, again, in the 50s, 60s group, as expected. But this one tends to show up in people who are younger of age. It can show up in the 20s in people. Uh, this one, unlike nodular melanoma, it has a very, very slow radial growth phase, even slower than superficial spreading melanoma, which is wonderful. Um, that could be... a it could be years sometimes before it hits its vertical growth phase. Um, so when it's in this horizontal growth phase uh, and slowly growing, or radial growth phase, a.k.a. horizontal growth phase, uh, some people call it a precancer called lentigo malignant. We talked about that last time. Lentigo malignant is always a precursor to lentigo malignant melanoma. 
Uh, but the key is it's in its radial growth phase or its horizontal growth phase, and it has not gotten down. How do you know? You have to get a biopsy of these things, right? Primary health care providers just have to follow the ABCs and, and obey those because you can't tell. This one you can tell is no good because it's got a nodule growing. And we said when nodules pop up, that typically means that it's in the vertical growth phase. Um, and yeah, this one's lentigo malignant melanoma. How do you tell the difference between this one and let's say superficial spreading melanoma that has entered its vertical growth phase? You really can't. The histologist has to, has to tell you that. And I won't get into how they tell, uh, tell that apart. So when you see these variegated lesions that you can't fold in half, they're bigger than five, six millimeters and they have a nodule associated with them, very bad sign. Um, they're usually strongly variegated. Here's a case where it's really not super strongly. And when I say strongly variegated, I mean it's super, super black and super light and none here. That's strong, like there's a strong contrast of colors. This one just is brown uh, and maybe a little red and light brown, a couple different shades. It's still variegated, but you know, they're usually, this is atypical. Um, this one turned out to be lentigo malignant it was still in its radial growth phase, so kind of the precursor of lentigo malignant melanoma. Yeah, this one is just, it's got all kinds of problems. It's got cancer in the eye going on, and yeah, it's got, it's got a big mess there. That's nodular malignant melanoma. Uh, what are the treatments? Might as well take a kind of a little rabbit hole. What are the treatments for these skin melanomas? Uh, well, you have to get them biopsied. If they break the ABCs, you get them biopsied. The smaller lesions, you take them right out with a biopsy. If it's a big lesion and it's going to require a plastic surgeon to come in, then you don't have to cut it out right away. You take a sample and get that anal analyzed immediately. Uh, some dermatologists do it right on the spot while the patient is still there. And if it is cancer, then they... Uh, then they remove it. The plastic surgeon has to come in, or you have to go to the plastic surgeon within a day or two uh, to fix that type of thing. Um, if it is cancerous, then what do you do? Uh, well, then the question is, if it's gotten down into the dermis and, and hypodermis where the blood vessels are, has it spread? Has it metastasized? So how do you know if it's metastasized? Well, you have to check the lymph nodes that are connected to that region of skin. And we've talked about, we're talking about lymph in lecture right now, but it's everywhere there's blood vessels, there's lymph vessels, right? Um, and so you, wanna, you want to biopsy the very first lymph node that drains that area of skin. Well, how do you know who the sentinel lymph node is? Well, there's a procedure uh, where you inject a sort of a radioactive dye into the lesion itself, and the dye will get soaked up by the lymph capillaries and the blood capillaries. We're not interested in the bloodstream, though, but it'll get into the lymph system, and it'll head for the lymph nodes, and it'll get caught in the lymph nodes. Um, and then this is, uh, the contrast can see this. So you can do fluoroscopy, a CT, or an X-ray even, and these lymph nodes will pop up. And once you find out who the lymph nodes are, then you have to go in there and biopsy those lymph nodes, being careful not to beaver dam them, right? We've talked about lymphedema, how the arm can fill up with fluid if they're damaged. But um, that's, that's how you do that. All right, this is the one that killed Bob Marley. This is ALM, uh, arcuolentigenous melanoma. And so uh, arcuolentig, like big, big, in uh, arcuolentigenous melanoma, um, aka sometimes it's called simple melanoma or just arcuol melanoma or acryl, like acryl melanoma. Um, it's about 5% of the melanoma pie, so it's fairly rare, but it can occur. And this one, as you can guess, this occur occurs on hairless skin. In other words, this one occurs either on the soles of your feet or the palms of your hand or underneath the nails. That's where this one occur, occurs. 
And this one is, like the other ones, it's a cancer of the melanocytes. And uh, age of occurrence is 50, 60 years, about the same. Um, this one is common and more common and not in white people, but in people of color, especially black people. They, as I just said, it only occur in the palms and soles of the feet uh, or in the nail apparatus uh, underneath the plate. Uh, Subungual melanoma, is, it's called when you, it occurs in the nail apparatus. Again, people of color, especially black people, are more at risk for this type of melanoma. 70% uh, of the diagnoses are in black people. Why they're susceptible, we don't know. Just like white people are susceptible to some types of diseases, some different races have different susceptibilities to different diseases, and it's probably some genetic thing that we just haven't figured out yet. Look at this one. That's scary, isn't it? That looks like nothing. And that is uh, ALM. That's melanoma that started. Okay, um, so yeah, that's why even dermatologists can misdiagnose these in 33% of people. So uh, this can be a sneaky one. We'll talk about longitudinal melanonychia next week, but nail streaks can sometimes look like ALM. Um, and yeah, it can imitate longitudinal melanonychia. And uh, yeah, so long streaks uh, in the nails, especially if this coloration occurs right here uh, in this proximal nail fold. Um, that's a really bad sign. That's called the Hutchinson sign, and we'll talk about that more next week. But that's the Bob Marley. He had a, a subungual melanoma, or he had an ALM in the first toe, and they... They, he was told, the story goes, he was told that that's cancer. You need to get that checked out. It looks cancerous. And he ignored it uh, and went for non-traditional treatment, herbs, and things like that. And it went to his brain and lungs, and they flew him to Miami, and it was too late. So you can't mess around with this one. Um, yeah, it's Now, this one doesn't occur from run-of-the-mill melanocytes. Uh, but they're still melanocytes. Normally in the nail matrix here, you have, they're called matrix melanocytes, and they're normally turned off. They don't inject these uh, newly born nail cells. They don't inject them. Uh, they don't inject them with pigment. So normally your nail is colorless. Uh, but when they become cancerous, and sometimes just when they activate, uh, they can inject these uh, these anecocytes, they're called. Those are nail cells, anecocytes. Just like carotinocytes, like these are carotinocytes. These are anecocytes. They can wake up and inject them when they're not supposed to, so you get a stream of these pigmented nail cells or anecocytes. And uh, there's a lot of other things. It's usually not cancer, but um, again, African Americans... Uh, and people of color, Hispanics as well. My wife has one of these. Um, yeah, they have these streaks. So you have to be careful with these things. Uh, very difficult to see in the early stages. There's a Caucasian with waited way too long. The whole nail is black and it's, it's invaded the skin. That's, that's stage four malignant melanoma there. It's already gotten into his liver and brain and... Uh, things like that. So very bad sign. That's Again, that's called a Hutchinson sign. Okay, Here's another one, even worse. It's gotten all the way up into her pip there, proximal interphalangeal joint. Another one. Well, that's actually a nodular melanoma, right? Uh, these uh, acrolentiginous melanomas, they only happen on the palms and on the soles of the feet and in the nail beds. That superficial spreading, I don't see a nodule there. Superficial spreading melanoma. Well, that one's not very densely variegated, so probably not dark enough to be superficial spreading melanoma. Uh, but on biopsy, it, it looks like seborrheic keratosis. On biopsy, it turned out to be superficial spreading melanoma. So you just can't tell. Again, primary health care providers, just follow the ABCs we talked about last week. 
Um, and if it breaks them, you make the referral and let the dermatologist worry about it. All right, thanks for watching. There's the bird. Um, these are birds that migrated through. They are here for about a month, I would say. Um, I shot this up at um, up in Joseph Grant Regional Park up there in Mount Hamilton. And, uh, yeah, very cool birds. They're already gone, though. They're, I've been up there a few times since. I haven't seen one of them, so they were just passing through. It's called a Western Kingbird. All right, see you guys later.